Thank you for the opportunity to speak here on a subject which is very dear to my heart, writer that I love, and uh, it's, it's good to see a group of people that are interested in this subject of the imagination, C.S. Lewis, the imaginative man. Now, I touched quite a lot upon Lewis's life, but I, I'm not going to go into every detail of his life. So um, if, you, if you are interested in his gaps and you want them filling in, um, I, I won't be able to say for hours afterwards, so you could take the book instead um, um, to, to fill you in. But I feel that a lot of you know quite a bit about Lewis already. In the 1950s, when post-war austerity was slowly passing, and the drudgery of caring for the elderly Mrs. Moore, essentially uh, Lewis's adoptive mother, Lewis was facing a great dilemma. If success had been, all, had been what he was after, he had it all. His broadcast talks during the war and the publication, in particular of the Screwtape Letters, had made him one of the highest profile Christian communicators of his time in Britain, along with the likes of Dorothy L. Sayers. His fame was spreading to the USA. A reporter from Time magazine had been in Oxford in 1944, researching a feature on him, interviewing, amongst other of his friends, Charles Williams. That story eventually appeared as a cover feature on the 8th of September 1947, taking as its, its angle the Screwtape Letters and entitled Don versus Devil. The writer was unable to fathom the mystery of Lewis's domestic situation with Mrs. Moore, no doubt because of the silence of his friends. From that point, Lewis's popularity in the United States took off and has been higher there than in his own country ever since, even though the wardrobe that led into another world is far more in common parlance in the British Isles than in the US. Lewis had long ago, like his friend Tolkien, left behind his ambition to be a major poet, but was very aware of the effectiveness of his books in helping to communicate Christian faith to modern readers. The BBC radio broadcast talks in wartime and his visit to RAF stations had helped him also to gauge what he could do as a popular speaker rather than an academic lecturer. But an, ex an experiment that was much closer to his heart, allowing him to directly engage with those who did not believe, was the Oxford University Socratic Club, one of the most successful Oxford societies for students, which had begun in the war years and which he continued to support with gusto when the war was over. His experiences with the club helped him to continue to develop as a Christian communicator, honing his skills. The club had a greatly, a greatly different scale to the large audiences of his BBC and RAF talks. It gave him the chance to interact much more personally with both his opponents and his supporters. Chaired by its founder, Stella Oldwinkle, the club discussed questions about Christian faith raised by atheists, agnostics, and those disillusioned about religion. Lewis served as president at Stella Aldwin Cold's request for many years. During the Socratic Club meetings, Lewis's wit was always ready. On one occasion, when as usual he was in the chair, someone very much taken up with a new analytical philosophy asked during the discussion time, how can you prove anything? I mean, how can you prove there is not a blue cow sitting on that piano? Lewis responded, in what sense blue? <laughs> a debate that Lewis had with philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe, who had studied in Cambridge under Ludwig Wittgenstein, is often interpreted as being responsible for a defeat which led Lewis into serious doubt about his whole approach to an intellectual defense of Christian faith and turned to writing children's stories about Narnia. Anscombe's paper, however, straightforwardly aimed to clarify and to bring out some confusion in an argument Lewis had used in chapter three of his book, Miracles. There he had held that a naturalist or materialist position was self-refuting. Lewis did acknowledge afterwards that he was unclear in his argument, but neither he nor Anscombe regarded it as anything less 
than essentially robust. In response to the debate, debate Lewis re rewrote the chapter, clarifying it for a later edition. Rather than destroying Lewis's confidence and forcing him to turn away from an intellectual defense of Christianity, what he did eventually acknowledge was that philo philosophy at that time had become increasingly specialized and analytical. He did not object to such analysis, but felt that if he tried to continue in that more and more rarefied world, he would only be communicating with a smaller and smaller audience. He increasingly felt that his calling was to a broader readership that had responded so well to his theological fiction, such as the Screwtape Letters. After this realization, he took a much more indirect approach to Christian communication. This elusiveness applied to further works of lay theology that Lewis wrote, such as The Four Loves in 1960, and even more so, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, published just after his death in 1964. It is true that for a while at the end of the 1940s, Lewis expected his books to fall into quiet obscurity, as he explained to a generous American called Dr. Warfield M. Führer, who supplied him with food parcels during the years of post-war austerity. He wrote, I'm going to be, if I live long enough, one of those men who was a famous writer in his 40s and dies unknown, like Christian going down into the green valley of humiliation. Lewis's impression of book sales was in fact wrong. This quiet humbling was not required for very long. With burgeoning interest in the USA in his writings and the success of his annually appearing stories of Narnia for children, he gradually realized that he had an important opportunity to seize in imaginative writing. Lewis was not working on an impulse when he was considering a radical change of direction in his, in his writing. A number of pointers can be seen in, in his life. The realization of change is captured in two letters he wrote, both to Americans. In one, he explained to the Milton Society of America why he was turning down a request to speak. He begins by pointing out that though a list of his books might look a mixed bag, they do have what he called a guiding thread, and that in his makeup, what he called the imaginative man, was the most basic point of him. Now, I think you've all got uh, a handout which has various quotes in it, and this is quote number one. He writes, the imaginative man in me is older, more continuously operative, and in that sense more basic than either the religious writer or the critic. It is he, in response to the poetry of others, made me a critic, and in defense of that response, sometimes a critical controversialist. It was he who, after my conversion, led me to embody my religious beliefs in symbolical or mythopoeic forms, ranging from screw tape to a kind of theologized science fiction. And it was, of course, he who has brought me in the last few years to write the series of Narnia stories for children, not asking what children want and then endeavoring to adapt to myself. This was not needed. But because the fairy tale was the genre that fitted for what I wanted to say. Lewis expressed his sense of a calling to a new direction in his writing in a more explicit letter. A leading American theologian, Carl F. H. Henry, wrote to Lewis in 1955, asking him to contribute to a new monthly magazine he was setting up as editor, called Christianity Today, and aiming to provide thoughtful theological comments on society and culture with a strong literary quality. Interestingly, Lewis would soon meet and like the evangelist Billy Graham, who was one of those involved in the creation of the magazine Christianity Today, which is still going strong to this day. The meeting was arranged by Reverend John Stott, who was based in London, when Graham led a university mission in Cambridge in November that year. Lewis replied to Carl Henry thoughtfully and respectfully. This is number three in your, on your sheet. My thought and talent, such as they are, now flow in different, though I think not less Christian channels, 
but I do not think I am at all likely to write more directly theological pieces. If I am now good for anything, it is for catching the reader unawares through fiction and symbol. I have done what I could in the way of frontal attacks, but now feel quite sure those days are over. I think another and earlier seed for this momentous decision by Lewis had been planted nearly 10 years before the, this letter, when he and his brother Warren, the, the year after the war, had traveled to the University of St. Andrews. Here, uh, Lewis would have been very aware that a number of years before the outbreak of war, Tolkien had given a seminal Andrew Lang lecture in the same place on the imaginative power of traditional tales of fairy, tales for adults, that laid bare his thinking behind the making of Middle-earth as a sub-creation, as he called it, thinking which was to influence Lewis's creation of Narnia. Now, after the war at St. Andrews, Lewis was made a Doctor of Divinity on 28th of June, 1946, a rare honor for a lay person. Some words expressed at the degree ceremony by Professor D.M. Bailey, Dean of the Faculty of Divinity, were truly remarkable. And this is the extract uh, number four on your sheet. With his pen and with his voice on the radio, Mr. Lewis has succeeded in capturing the attention of many who will not readily listen to professional theologians and has taught them many lessons concerning the deep things of God. In recent years, Mr. Lewis has arranged a new kind of marriage between theological reflection and poetic imagination. And this fruitful union is now producing works which are difficult to classify in any literary genre. It can only be said in respectful admiration that he pursues, and here he quotes, things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. Even if not a seed to Lewis's later change, these words may have helped him to clarify thoughts he was already harboring about future ventures. A visiting American called Chad Walsh to whom Lewis had confided about his life so far, shows that he was aware of Lewis's intention to shift the focus in his writings. His, his, he wrote the first study of Lewis, which is called The Apostle to the Skeptics, which was published in 1949, and it was penned not long after Lewis's honorary Doctor of Divinity was conferred. And what he writes points to Lewis's future. Patently, Lewis has not written himself out, but the books he has in mind suggest he is taking a holiday from the kind of writing that has created his public reputation. His admirers busily urge various theological topics upon him, but so far as I know, he has no immediate plans for future works of apologetics. It could be said, however, that Lewis was to move from conventional apologetics to what might be called imaginative apologetics, getting past what Lewis called the, quote, watchful dragons, which I'll explain a bit more later. Now, still, looking, still in this period, on the domestic front in 1947, um, it had been a difficult year for Lewis. Uh, as, as, um, in his life at his home, the Kilns, which is on the fringe of Oxford, life there was becoming more and more fraught it became difficult, if not impossible, to retain domestic helps under Mrs. Moore's increasingly autocratic rule, as Lewis's brother called it. I must add that she was very much in decline at that time in her health. From one day to the next, Lewis wrote in a letter at that time that he did not know when he, would, he, would, he could pull back from his duties, as he put it, as a nurse and a domestic servant. He explained in that same letter that, quote, there are psychological as well as material difficulties in my home. An additional burden on Lewis had become his brother Warren's increasing bouts of drinking, a symptom of his creeping alcoholism, a condition that distressed Lewis considerably. A further burden was the aging and increasingly decrepit family dog called Bruce, to which Mrs. Moore clung tenaciously. It was a relief to the brothers when he died in his dotage early in 1950. I must add that Lewis was very fond of animals. 
In his diary, Warney, uh, Warren recalled some of the dog's worst traits. One was that Bruce would sometimes bark incessantly all night, and then, while he dozed during the day, Mrs. Moore would order the boys, as she called Lewis and, War and Warney, to make no noise in case they woke him. <laughs> Released from his ob obligations to his adopted mother with her death in 1951, with a period in a nearby care home before that, was an important element of change for Lewis at this period. His shift of direction towards more indirect and elusive communication of Christian theology was no more evident, of course, than in his starting to write the first of the Chronicles of Narnia. This was just two, uh, two years after the publication of one of the best of his overtly theological books, Miracles, in 1947. That book was, aimed, was directly aimed at thoughtful lay people for whom the question of miracles was real. It compared the very different perspectives of a materialist or naturalist view and one which was a supernaturalist view. Lewis's change of direction did not distract him from the academic writings of his day job. Somewhat unlike his friend Tolkien, whose professional insights into language were more and more being poured into his imaginative writings, even though The Lord of the Rings was essentially complete by 1949, even though it wasn't published until the mid-50s. And Lewis continued to write a sequence of Narnian stories during the 1950s. The last battle was scheduled as the final book to be published, appearing in 1956. It won the prestigious literary award, the Carnegie, Carnegie Medal, in recognition of the whole series. Lewis's change of strategy, turning to imaginative writing, firmly underpinned by orthodox Christian belief, was paying off. The books were being received by a very wide readership. Lewis's postbag was getting larger and larger as child readers started to write to him, along with the numerous adult readers of other books, such as the Screwtape Letters. Avoiding religious language and specific reference to biblical history, Lewis in the Narnian stories demonstrates the distinctive and real nature of God in the magical figure of Aslan, which is Turkish for lion, who is elusive yet definite, wild, surprising, and always shaping events his good way, even when all seems dark and lost. Lewis balances Aslan's wildness and terrifying nature perfectly with his approachability, beauty, and gentleness. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the children, Lucy and Susan, do something that they never would have dared to do without his permission. They sink their cold hands into the sea of his beautiful mane to comfort him. After he returns to life, Aslan dances with them, and afterwards Lucy can't make up her mind whether it was like playing with a thunderstorm or with a kitten. Sorry about the spoilers, by the way, if some of you haven't read the Narnian Chronicles. <laughs> it's a bit hard to avoid them. Now, I want to speak a little bit about a challenge that was made between Lewis and Tolkien in their friendship. The main path into imagination that Lewis decided to take in the 50s had, had, clear, had a, an earlier clear seed. Important was a challenge that Lewis and Tolkien had set themselves 20 years before the publication of the final Narnian stories, as was in 1936. This was when they agreed that the world needed more of the kind of books they liked to read, and that they should each write one, one on space and the other on time travel. That key moment of challenge represents an earlier crisis period in the life of Lewis, which was also one for Tolkien. This is that both at that time in the 30s had published very little scholarship for a substantial period, though Lewis's The Allegory of Love, many years in preparation, was about to appear, as was Tolkien's milestone essay on Beowulf. According to Tom Shippey, both must have felt anxious and underpublished, with only each other to keep them writing. Both frustrated writers felt that their ambitions to be significant poets had been thwarted, even though both had expended, in Shippey's words, immense time and energy to writing poetry. For Lewis, the challenge also marked his turn from writing narrative poetry to prose fiction. In fact, much of the prose he wrote from then on would become increasingly poetic. In 
so much so that Lewis's friend, the poet Ruth Pitter, turned some of the text of his second science fiction story, Perilandra, into poetry. It was rather like William Wordsworth turning prose of his sister Dorothy's journals into poetry. There is something amusing about two Oxford scholars, both engaged in pioneering academic exploration of language and literature, deciding to write a fiction for, for an audience far wider than their academic readership. They were certainly talking about writing uh, popular fiction. Lewis didn't want to write anything like his early book, The, the, the uh, Pilgrim's Regress, because he'd learned that it was some of it was much too different for the general reader, diff difficult for the general reader. So let's go back to the new path that, um, that Lewis took in the 50s and Narnia. Lewis was doing many things in creating the Chronicles of Narnia. What is clear from his life and what he said about Narnia is that he was telling a story for the love of it, creating a secondary world inspired by his friend Tolkien's sub-creation of Middle-earth and embodying virtues and values he had himself found to be desirable and indeed essential for our very humanity. It was aimed at a modern trend towards what he called the abolition of the human. But he was also some, doing something that he, along with close friends like Tolkien and authors he loved like George MacDonald and G.K. Chesterton, had discovered about the nature of stories. Stories, they had dis uh, stories, he felt, are subversive. They tiptoe past, in his words, the watchful dragons that would keep us in the dark and stay on us a prison. Stories can change us to the core, undeceiving us. Undeception is one of the central themes in Lewis, and moulding our perceptions and very consciousness. In telling Narnia, Lewis is concerned to present his vision as fact, not only theory. He clearly felt that it could be more effective in persuading people than his carefully argued book Miracles. Though fiction of wonder, the Narnian sequence is full of resonances and connections with the world of reality. The lion's roar made the earth shake and his song had brought the world into being. Now to get to the heart of what I'm saying this evening and that is capturing the real and tasting the other. Though there is a great consistency over Lewis's views of imagination and myth over many years, they were, they were deepened and I think transformed by his acceptance in, in the middle of his life of the Christian doctrine of incarnation. This acceptance was due to seeing the connection between imagination and myth on the one hand and the incarnation of the divine and the human Christ in real history on the other hand, when, as Lewis was to put it, myth became fact. Tolkien played a major part in convincing Lewis of the connection back in 1931 when, when his friend was convert, converted to Christianity. Lewis's memoir of the first half of his life, Surprised by Joy, is told in, parallel, in a parallel way to his allegory, The P uh, Pilgrim's Regress. The memoir came out in... Um, 1956, and the, the Pilgrim's Regress was way back in 1933. Both have at heart a quality of what he technically called joy, or inconsolable longing, or desire, that nothing on earth could fulfill. Lewis's quest, which finally led to a reluctant conversion to theism, and then to Christian belief, found him discovering that joy was in fact the telltale fin a footprint of the supreme object of human desire. This other for Lewis turned out to be a person behind the universe, not blind matter, a realization that led to his return with the help of friends like Tolkien and, and Owen Barfield to Christian belief and what Dorothy L. Sayers would call the drama of its dogma, dogma or doctrine. The development of Lewis's thinking about imagination was part of his quest to grasp or capture the real and to achieve a surrender, though reluctant, of the self to the other. The surrender in various forms is often captured as almost a signature theme of undeception in his fiction and in his memoir, which I'll discuss a little bit more later. <laughs> 
This quest for the real explains the course of his imaginative writing, from his early allegory, The Pilgrim's Regas, through his science fiction, his theological fiction such as The Screwtape Letters and The Narnian Chronicles, to his retelling of the myth of Cupid and Psyche in his novel, Till We Have Faces. It also explains his deliberate change in strategy in the 1950s, his move in emphasis from abstract or heavenly, heavily reasoned Christian apologetics, such as the problem of pain, to a more concrete and poetic style of communication that he had already developed to the most extent in his imaginative writings. Now we have to remember that Lewis was an able philosopher and his quest for the real was part of, perennial, of a perennial discussion from classical to contemporary philosophers of the relationship between the universal and the particular, the abstract and the concrete, the general and the instance. Like Tolkien, his colleague in the Oxford English School, he explored the quandary in language and literature. As a philosopher, he explored it in human thought. Now what I've just said is an example of abstract and general reasoning. Let me quote Lewis to give somewhat more particular but still necessarily rather general insights into his quest. In a letter he wrote in 1949, he confessed, poetry I take to be the continual effort to bring language back to the actual. Let me repeat that. Poetry I take to be the continual effort to bring language back to the actual. In the second book of his science fiction trilogy, set on the planet Venus, the central character is a Cambridge philologist or language specialist called Alwyn Ransom, loosely based upon Tolkien. Upon his return to Earth, um, Ransom um, talks to Lewis, he's re uh, Lewis who is a fictional character in the story as well, just to confuse things. And uh, Lewis as a character in the fiction records in the book. I had incautiously said to Ransom, of course, I realize it's all rather too vague for you to put into words when he's recounting his adventures on Venus. When he said this, um, Ransom took me up rather sharply for such a patient man by saying, on the contrary, it is words that are vague. The reason why the thing can't be expressed is that it's too, too definite for language. The quest for the concrete definite thing, or the real, as opposed to the abstraction, is one of the central themes of Lewis's life and writings. As we know from the Narnian stories, Lewis was capable of expressing profound ideas in a way that a child could grasp. In 1956, Lewis wrote memorably of the importance and elusiveness of the definite thing to a child, Joan Lancaster, who had written to him while encouraging her writing skills. And this is the extract number seven on your sheet. You describe your wonderful night very well. That is, you describe the place and the people and the night and the feeling of it all very well, but not the thing itself, the setting but not the jewel. And no wonder, Wordsworth often does the same in his prelude, you're bound to read it in about 10 years time. Don't try it now or you'll only spoil it for later reading. It's, it's full of moments in which everything except the thing itself is described. If you become a writer, you'll be trying to describe the thing all your life and lucky if out of dozens of books, one or two sentences just for a moment come near to getting it across. Now, I must add that uh, Lewis often gives advice to children that write to him about how to write, and I've found it very helpful when you're talking to adults about how to write. The advice is just so good. Not only did Lewis find the thing elusive to capture in writing, but also elusive when we think about it in order to capture it in a theory. And this is uh, number eight in your, in your, on your sheet. Human intellect is incurably abstract. Pure mathematics is the type of successful thought. Yet the only realities we experience are concrete. This pain, this pleasure, this dog, this man. While we are loving the man, 
bearing the pain, enjoying the pleasure, we are not intellectually apprehending pleasure, pain or personality. When we begin to do so, on the other hand, the concrete realities sink to the level of mere instances or examples. We are no longer dealing with them, but with that which they exemplify. This is our dilemma, either to taste and not to know, or to know and not to taste, or more strictly, to lack one kind of knowledge because we are in an experience, or to lack another kind because we are outside it. If only my toothache would stop, I could write another chapter about pain. <laughs> but once it stops, what do I know about pain? Lewis is pointing out that there is more than one kind of truthful knowledge and that the process of theoretical thought excludes knowledge by experience, that is, existential knowledge. As he, studied with this, as he struggled with this dilemma over many years, Lewis found the key to its solution in a necessary contrast between reason and imagination. In an experiential or operative knowledge, he came to believe, the imagination plays as important a role as the intellect does in theoretical knowledge. In the literary arts, Lewis found the imagination most profoundly at work in the creation of myth. And here we're at um, extract number nine on your sheet. Of this tragic dilemma, the divorce of the abstract and the tangible, myth is the partial solution. In the enjoyment of great myth, we come nearest to experiencing as a concrete what can otherwise be understood only as an abstraction. At this moment, for example, I am trying to understand something very abstract indeed, the fading, vanishing of tasted reality as we try to grasp it with a discursive reason. Probably I have made heavy weather of it. But if I remind you instead of Orpheus and... Um, I always get blank with Eurydice, how he was suffering to lead her by the hand, but when he turned round to look at her, she disappeared which is merely a principle become imaginable. The work of the imagination, Lewis implies, is larger than its role in the visual or literary or other arts, or in the sciences. And it is the imagination, more than any other of our mental faculties, that is most successful in perceiving and capturing the thing. This is because the imagination, in his words, is the organ of meaning, not of truth. The thing captured by the imagination is an object of thought, like any real thing, rather than an abstract truth. It belongs to the world of experience, sensation and contingency, and yet embodies general qualities of meaning by the very nature of imaginative perception, just as a theoretical truth quite properly embodies a methodological reduction by the nature of abstract reasoning which if turned into an idol falls into the perils of what we call reductionism, where everything's reduced to one aspect of reality. Lewis, it is clear, thought it folly to confuse a theoretical truth with a real thing. As Lewis argued, truth is always about something, but reality is about which truth is. I'll say that again because it's a bit of a... Uh, they were hard to take in at this time in, in the evening. Truth is always about something, but reality is, about, is that about which truth is. The role of imagination in truth-seeking and knowledge-gaining was much discussed by Lewis and his close friends, such as Owen Barfield and Tolkien. There were many differences as well as affinities between them as they discussed a theme whose pedigree belongs to the Romantic movement in poets and thinkers such as Wordsworth and Coleridge, which has its background, which, which has its background the issue of what is called the Enlightenment Project today, and its child, the positivist claim that the natural sciences and rationalism are the only models of truth and knowledge, and that values are messy distractions to, in capturing facts. I heard somebody say this on the radio the other day. There are numerous examples of Lewis's concern with qualities and abstractions and their capture in imaginative literature in his writings through the years. In his essay on Shakespeare's Hamlet, 
he isolated the state of being dead as an overriding quality embodied in the play. He remarked, it is this which gives to the whole play its quality of darkness and of misgiving. The world of Hamlet is the world where one has lost one's way. In another academic paper on Sir Walter Scott, he spoke of the, what he called the sweetness and light of Scott's mind and remarked that it was he who taught us feeling for, the period, for a period. In an essay on William Morris, he discussed a balance and yet tension between two moods in his writings, a positive, as in Lewis's words, a positive and violent passion for immortality and a feeling that the world of mortality is more than enough for our allegiance. Finally, many more examples could be cited. I give a favorite of mine. Lewis isolated undeception, that is the process of becoming undeceived, as the pivot or watershed of four of Jane Austen's novels. In Lewis's words, in Northanger Abbey and Emma, it precipitates the happy ending in Sense and Sensibility, it renders it possible. In Pride and Prejudice, it initiates that re-evaluation of Darcy, both in Elizabeth's mind and in our minds, which is completed by the visit to Pemberley. Now, after reading Lewis's point about undeception in Jane Austen's fiction, it opened my eyes to the frequency of this theme in Lewis's fiction. I kept finding it everywhere. Now, much long after that, I felt, I, one day I felt the need to read up again on what Lewis had said about undeception. I looked through various collections of, of Lewis's essays for the one on them, um, which, which would be titled Undeception or something like that, but I failed to find it. Then I remembered that he'd brought it up in his essay on Jane Austen. And when I, found, and when I looked at the essay, I was shocked to find how short the comment was that he'd made considering how central it was to his fictional world. But then um, you, I, I found as a reader of Lewis that his, that his work is actually shot through with, with insights, vivid insights that are, um, can take you into many places and probably into many libraries. Now I just want to say a little um, to, to fill this out more on um, what Lewis called transposition, the placing of one thing in another in a transformed way, you know, like in music when you um, transpose say, an orchestral piece to a piece for piano. That's an exa one of the examples that, that Lewis used. Or if you, um, say, you record uh, an orchestral piece. Now, in the olden days of tape recordings, it, it would transpose into a pattern on the, on, the, on the tape, and now it's grooves and things on a, on a DVD, and, uh, and then it gets more complicated with zeros and ones um, in the Internet and so on. But there's, they're all forms of transposition. In exploring how myth and imagination make it, makes possible an integration of the abstract and the concrete, Lewis turned in his sermon essay, Transposition, to the principle of hierarchy, which he believed existed in both nature and in supernature. In knowledge gaining, the principle of hierarchy is the movement from concrete to abstract, from lower to higher. For instance, we indwell our bodily f facilities in order to perceive higher levels. I want to mention a thinker that uh, I feel is very important and has a number of affinities with Lewis and with and people like Barclay, uh, like uh, Barfield. And this was Michael Polanyi, the thinker Michael Polanyi, scientist and thinker. Michael Polanyi wrote very clearly about this in his profound, his groundbreaking book, Personal Knowledge, and elsewhere. He, he wrote many um, important journal articles on this theme. In Thought and the Formation of Truth Claims, the material causal conditions, such as those of our brains, are transcended. In thinking, we actively participate in a higher level. The focus is on something beyond the material. There is in intentionality when we think. Thoughts are about something other than themselves. A similar thing happens with metaphor and story, if I understand Lewis correctly. The specific concrete matrix of the image or story allows the general and universal, but is not identical with it. The universal and general is on a richer level as it retains all that is concrete and particular in its immediate context, but also has something more 
some, something, some object that transcends it. Lewis explains all this beautifully in his essay, Transposition, and also plays out in the ideas of his book, Miracles, especially uh, in terms of um, think, the relation between thinking and our brains. The chapter three of the book, The Cardinal Difficulty with Naturalism, where he explores human reasoning. I'm not saying much about the essay on transposition or else we would be here much later into the evening and we will all miss our buses and trains and things like that. Owen Barfield believes that transposition was a rare disclosure by Lewis of, to, to quote Barfield, the movement of his mind on the subject of imagination. Barfield slowly came to realize that in his view, the essay, to quote him, amounts to a theory of imagination in which imagination is not mentioned. He adds, Barfield adds, read it carefully and you will find all the proper ingredients. Metamorphosis, interpenetration of meanings, interpenetration of mind and body, of spirit and soul. For Lewis and others of like mind and imagination, the historical moment of the incarnation of Christ and the linked events of his death and resurrection, when supremely myth became fact, and the elusive capturing of the general and the abstract in the tangible happened, marked the vindication of the work of the imagination. This is why Tolkien commented in his essay on fairy story. Art, he said, has been verified. Art has been verified. As Coleridge, MacDonald and Dorothy Sayers claimed, the human imagination reveals the presence of the image of God in human beings. For them, we have eternity within our hearts. It follows from this that through the matrix of our own physical bodies, and while dependent upon our sensations and the firing of our brain neurons, we are able to look into and actually participate in a world immensely larger than our senses. As in all knowledge, from the lower we grasp the higher by surrendering to it. And this principle of surrender is found in all knowledge um, Surrender of the self is for Lewis central to gaining oneself as he followed his master. I can't resist finally mentioning a fascinating and perhaps surprising example of such surrender and gain that Lewis offered from his life experience. It comes from one of his last books published before he died, in the period when the imaginative man was more central in his writing. Its profund profundity struck me the first time I read it, and I never forgot it but it also made me chuckle a little. It's a bit like if you've got a friend who does a lot of fishing and spends hours by the, the river fishing and, and will, if you get them talking about it, it might be a very long uh, piece of talking. Here we have Lewis talking about books. The unexpected dimensions of reading. Lewis was completely aware of his bookishness. His love particularly of old books inspired his literary scholarship on the literature of the 16th century, the medieval allegory of love, and in particular, the poetry of Spencer and of Milton. It is the secret, I think, of the continued readability and freshness of his literary studies many decades after they were written. How does reading and reception of other arts relate to escaping from self-centeredness and grasping what is objective to us? Lewis's answer shows the complete integration between his scholarship and his fiction even his Narnian stories for children. He writes, In love, in virtue, in the pursuit of knowledge, and in the reception of the arts, we are going out of the self to correct its provincialism and heal its loneliness. Obviously, he continues, this process can be described either as an enlargement or as a temporary annihilation of the self. But that is an old paradox. He that loseth his life shall save it. Lewis is an experiment in criticism, published in 1961, where he says this, is in effect a deceptively simple guide to reading, distilling a lifetime scholarship and reading, both high and lowbrow. To quote a memorable passage, and this is the number 10 uh, extract on your sheet. The man who is contented to be only himself and therefore less of a self, is in prison. My eyes are not enough for me. I will see through those of others. Reality, 
even seen through the eyes of many, is not enough. I will see what others have invented. Even the eyes of all humanity are not enough. I regret that the brutes cannot write books. In reading great literature, I become a thousand men and yet remain myself. Like the night sky in the, green, uh, the Greek poem, I see with a myriad eyes, but it is still I who see. Here, as in worship, in love, in moral action, and in knowing, I transcend myself and am never more myself than when I do. Here Lewis speaks of a parallel between reading and love, and a couple of pages before had mentioned how, in his words, love we es in love we escape from ourself into one other. He explored this in his book, The Four Loves, one of the four being that of friendship, which he deeply valued throughout his life, and which is one of the secrets behind his popularity with many throughout the world, both East and West. And on that point, I will, I will finish. Thank you.